Welcome to episode 64 of the Serious About Security podcast for November 14, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. This week I'm joined again by Mike Hill and uh, Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley, and Mike will have the first uh, topic today. Okay, thanks, Preston. Um, so the first article is uh, from Brian Krebs. He reported this week that uh, Facebook has been sending out warnings uh, to users that if they um, use the same username and password on Adobe as they do for Facebook, that uh, essentially their account is kind of being uh, kept in the dark a little bit. Uh, they, they can't be found on Facebook until they change their Facebook password. Um, so. I've seen a few articles on this. I think this is a very proactive approach by Facebook, and, and I commend them for this, but it looked like there was a lot of confusion as to how all this was happening, and some people felt, well, maybe Facebook and Adobe are sharing the same user credentials. What, what's going on here? Uh, so, so if we back up a little bit, uh, towards the end of October, Adobe announced uh, a breach in which uh, over 150 million accounts were, the, the information was, uh, was captured uh, in an encrypted format, of which only 38 million were active. So, you know, that kind of limits the amount of damage. To 38 million. To 38 million. Uh, but still, a, a very large breach. And as I said, to make it worse, this dump of their database was not hashed passwords, but it was encrypted passwords. Um, and, and really, the significant difference to understand there is that if I make my password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Keith makes his password one two three four five six, and Preston makes it the same, and we're in this 38 million list. That encrypted version of our passwords is exact, calculates the exact same value, even though it's encrypted. So, if I put in a really vague password hint like, uh, "You'll never guess this," but uh, Preston over there puts one two three four five six, and it's his password hint. It's easy for people to kind of reverse engineer and say, well, gee, if, if this is the password, then it's the password for all of these people. Um, so it, it's a very bad thing. People are, are attacking this list and, and breaking these passwords, trying to decrypt them, if you will, figure out you know, um, who's used these passwords. So essentially what Facebook did is they said, well, here's the passwords that have already been cracked, essentially. We're going to run them through our own hash algorithm. So they're taking the, the plain text version of the password, running it through their algorithm with the email address of the Facebook user. And then what they're doing is they're contacting those Facebook users. Um, so I want to make it clear, Facebook is not vulnerable in this at all. What, what's vulnerable are users that use the same account credentials on multiple sites. So if the account credentials are used on Adobe are the same ones that you use on Facebook, Considering that the, if your account has been cracked on Adobe, someone could take those credentials and log into Facebook. So, so Facebook, I think, is doing the right thing here. Uh, I, I'm encouraged by what they're doing here, and I, I believe it was also reported that uh, diapers.com and, and soap.com did the same thing. Uh, so I thought this would be a, a fun one to talk about. I, I guess I would like to see uh, I'd like to see this technique catch on. I'd like to see that the big sites like Facebook and, and Twitter and Google and uh, LinkedIn take this kind of approach. Maybe they can even work together a little bit to proactively um, you know, help protect their users or at least limit the damage done to their sites. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Well, I think uh, Adobe definitely did not follow much of the advice that, that we've heard many times before about password hashing. <laughs> so that's one problem. Um, and you're right, I think it's nice to see that Facebook is actually being proactive with their own users who may have reused passwords. So that's something else we tell people not to do as well. Um, in addition to Facebook and soap.com and diapers.com, I believe LastPass also has an email check system uh, where you can just plug in your email address into the LastPass webpage and it will tell you whether your account was listed among those that had been compromised and then some information about what to do to go and reset that. Uh, so that's good to see. LastPass has done that before with other 
Yeah, other a list, they usually put something out. Exactly. So um, they do it. There's another one that used to be called hasmyaccountbeenhacked.com. I don't know if that site's still up or not. I haven't checked. But that one also keeps these lists. So you can always go in and check by inserting your email address into it, and it would tell you whether that was one of the accounts listed in a variety of different uh, incidents. So. It's good to see companies being proactive. It's bad to see companies like Adobe still screw it up. So. Well, just, I think this is especially disturbing to me that basically, you know, one, if you focus on one piece of information, the, the key for their encryption, the encryption, and you have 150 million passwords. Yeah. To me, that's especially disturbing. And I hope at least Adobe shows a really good password for that encryption, like a randomly generated... Not one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. also kind of shows the so. uh, the importance of password hints. Yes, uh, yeah, that's, that's true. And because given that a fair number of users reuse the same passwords, which you can see from the hash that you had to look at, um, just looking at their hint, you could probably most likely guess what the pass generally is. If I have to give a hint, hint, it's last pass or something similar. Well, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look it up somewhere. But it's an interesting point. Should they have, yeah. granted, they were encrypting, but should they have at least encrypted that information as well yeah. as they stored it? It seems like they should have probably should have encrypted have. everything, not yeah. just the password. I mean, obviously, their method of hiding the password was to encrypt it, to hash it. But that, that's a problem. Yeah, it's hashing, actually, hashing, yeah. hashing is no one way. way. You can't you can't reverse a hash. Right. Where with you encryption, reverse encryption with encryption. Right. right. Sure. So, I mean, in, in, but that's in, not how password schemes are supposed to work. So. Right. And and in, and in a way, they pro somebody in there probably said, "Well, this is probably just good." I mean. Probably, and some programmer probably set it up that way. And it wasn't it was Programmers are all to on. do, <laughs> <Point fingers. laughs> but they think, oh, well, you know, you know, I can do it this way in crypto, and that's easy, and that's just as good, and they don't think I can get the product released on time. And that's the one. And we can get the password back, too, which yes. may yes. be a good thing. Why run through the hash? Yeah. Well, if the customer hash really hash. wants to know what their password was before. <laughs> Yeah, but no, that's obviously a bad thing. I'm making a joke there. But, uh, so, like I said, I'm not going to so much focus on Adobe because it doesn't surprise me. Um, and I think it's just a great illustration. I, I did want to mention one of the things that I do, and I want to give you credit, Keith, because you told me this a few years ago. I don't even know if you remember this. Probably not. But when I signed up for a new account uh, using an email address, you mentioned that you can use the plus sign. So I can put my email address plus uh, I don't trust this site dot com. Or, you know, and if they support it, it'll still go, it'll be able to deliver to my regular account. But in this instance, it would have kind of protected me a little bit. Because what I could use is I could use what would appear to be a unique email identifier on each site I visit, but it still all goes back to my general email. So I wanted to mention that as a, as a potential technique. Like if I put uh, my email address plus adobe.com or, you know, at gmail.com, for example, um, then if they were sending me messages, it would still go through to my Gmail account. But if I were part of this hack, you know, so I could look at it and say, well, okay, well, maybe they use plus Facebook on their Facebook account, but maybe I don't. Maybe I use plus FB123 or something, you know. And it gives you a little more, maybe a little more protection. I, I still wouldn't recommend reusing passwords, but, yeah, but I know, know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think this, this is a case where reusing passwords, no matter how strong your password was, if they break that key, right. then your strong password is compromised. Right. Well, yeah. even, if, so, even if you use a strong password on every, the same strong password on every site, you, yes. you, you, and you're like, well, I'm using a strong password, so I can use the same one on every single site. Well, here's why you shouldn't do that. That's why you should not do that. Yeah. Absolutely. But <clears throat> if you use the strong, well, so say if you use a strong password to play devil's advocate, do you think they can crack it based on it? Do you think if somebody compromises the key that was used to encrypt all the passwords? Yes. But as, they, but we, as far as we know, no one's compromised that. Right? As far as we know. As far as we know. know. I'm, sure, somebody could, I'm, sure they're, should I'm sure they're working on it. Well, I'm, I'm sure they are too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have, uh, this is one attack where you have uh, 
a ciphertext attack where you have lots of ciphertext, then you can use that as input in yes. your encrypt analysis. So yeah. hopefully that's not going to... You have ciphertext and you have known... Uh, and you have some known, some known plain text. Well. So, so that so can use... Do we know what this kind of encryption was used? I don't think, I don't think that's that was a no. Considering that they mm -hmm. said this is back, I think that I've heard something that might have been back of stuff that might be old encryption as well. Oh, wow. So, uh, so I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so our best tips are, if you have an Adobe account, you should change your password. Absolutely. If you've used that password somewhere else, change, change all. all of them. <laughs> and, um, and make them strong passwords. And to really make it easy on yourself, get like a password safe, like LastPass, or a password safe, or I think there's another one you use to, to make life easy on you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think that's all. All right. Well, I have a second uh, article, and uh, this one's about a IE zero day exploit uh, that is being used uh, that is apparently run from memory only, so it doesn't actually write anything to the disk, um, which is which is kind of unique and interesting. Um, because it makes it difficult to detect and it makes it difficult to analyze just because there's no real, there's not much to analyze. You can all would be all in memory analysis and when you reboot the computer, the malware is gone and, and you can't analyze it anymore. Um, there, the, uh, the uh, article that uh, I read surmises that the, the uh, attackers are confident enough that they can compromise the computer that they, uh, they, they chose this method because they think they can get control of the computer before the user who is infected reboots their computer. Or it's possible that they put it on sites where they figure the intended victims will continually go to the site and continually essentially get infected with the malware and so they will also be, be able to do it uh, on a daily basis or, or whatever. I, I don't think there was an, uh, anything about what sites were infected, but it was, I guess, some popular sites that they figured that they'd be visited by U.S. defense contractors. So, yeah, it's interesting. Well, the only information they have on that, and we do call these watering hole attacks because kind of like the alligator who sits below the surface, they wait for the animals to come up to the water's edge, and then they jump out and grab yeah. them, right? So that's I'm the like, idea of the I'm water like fishing hole. where you send an email yes. to a person. You, you sit on a site and wait for them to come. Yeah, a lot of this is drive-by downloads. They're downloading stuff off the site, or they're just visiting pages and, and through either this the, the TIFF uh, image uh, zero day vulnerability that's going around or through some other mechanism they exploit browser vulnerabilities and this is one that does that. Uh, they don't name the, the site involved but they do say it's a US based non-governmental organization that hosts domestic and international policy guidance so yes probably some very interesting people will go to a site like that and um, and this is they're falling victim to this attack so it's very interesting. And it's interesting because there's nothing on the disk to look at. And some virus scanners look at stuff in memory. But the way this was uh, encoded and encrypted, it kind of defeats a lot of those in-memory testing. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of virus uh, software will, will uh, look at files as they're written to disk and see if there's any sure. malware in them. Because until this, pretty much all malware would write stuff to disk so that it could persist between reboots. Yeah. Um, there's been malware like this before, but but like you said, this is one in which they they just stick to memory only, and if this machine gets rebooted, well, it's lost. But uh, they're likely to come back to the same site and suffer the same sort of attack again. Right. So you're back in. <laughs> yes, the persistence exists on the website and, and not on the file. I guess it affected IE 7, 8, 9, and 10. XP and Windows 7. So I found that interesting too. I was just sitting here wondering why uh, is IE6 not around anymore? And what about Vista? You know, why why were those not 
Is it just that those happen to be the victim? What the victims were using? It could be. Is that just the only metric they had? Yeah, I mean, it be. It could be some difference in. Or maybe the this was just left out of the description on what was vulnerable. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was just curious because I thought nobody's nobody used nobody it. Uses, uh, yeah. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> uses IE6. Maybe somebody should. Maybe it, maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe I'll fall back. In the <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't advise using IE6. No so one does. I think you all have to find the internet doesn't work. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> are, are, there, are there good tools for IE? Like, no, does no script run on IE? I don't use IE much. Is there anything like that that would help that you guys know of? There is, there, there's um, um, tracking blocking on IE. Um, which is like ad block and ad blocker, and it can use the ad block plus list, so you can block ads. But as far as no script, you, you can go in and turn off scripting capabilities. Yeah, and that there might be yeah. there might be another there might be another tool that you can run kind of in the background that will block it. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Top of my head. Of it, of it. There was some note that there was this thing from Microsoft called the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, and as of the 12th of November actually released version 4.1. Um, and I don't know much about this thing, but what it says that it does is it does data execution prevention, mandatory address space, layout randomization, structured exception handler, overwrite protection, export address table, access filtering, anti ROP, and SSL TLS certificate trust pinning. Now that's a lot of different security controls and Half of them, I don't even know what they are. So apparently there's a toolkit out there which can help mitigate some of these types of attacks, but I'm going to be looking into this one a little more uh, because this, this was new to me. I'm not a, a Windows user, so but I do have responsibility for a lot of Windows systems. Yeah, I would say, I I'd honestly say that, um, that uh, IE has the ability to do what NoScript does in their, I, I mean, I'm looking on the internet, in their, in their zones, they have the mm -hmm. zones, and you could actually put all internet sites in the untrusted zone, untrusted zone and then yeah. move them to the trusted zone, just kind of like what you do with NoScript. I mean, right. you do that with NoScript, all sites are essentially untrusted, and you trust them, so you could actually use the zones to create a NoScript-like functionality. Yeah, but I guess I was driving at, I don't know what this strategic site was set up as, but I imagine maybe it's pulling in third-party resources. So if you vis visited this site with like a NoScript, you'd say allow the main domain, but don't allow. Right, which, which, which the trusted zone would do. With the trusted zone would do the same thing. You allow domain, you know, allow domain essentially, and, and things like that. But the, but the domain they were going to was infected, so even if you allow, if right. you were like, well, I go to this site all the time, I trust it. The problem well, is, you know, is still, it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. help you with, with, with the TIFF for a problem, because TIFF is not a script. It is an image format. Yeah, that's true. That exploits a bug in the image processor, so that wouldn't help either. That would so help, you yeah. You'd have a bad TIFF. In fact, well, you in fact on the servers, and on servers, if you install Microsoft Windows on a server, i.e. is set up, so to not trust anything. Not trust anything, yeah. So, well, hopefully, a desktop's not the case. Sure. Why do you think it's just IE that's vulnerable to this? What is it about IE? Is it like the DB script stuff? I mean, is it just the, yeah, the method they're it's using? It's some, some part of the way the browser works. The browser they're exploiting all the things. So. And probably the contractors are targeting use IE. Well, true. I mean, there are there are a lot of places that lock that you know lock down environments, and they don't allow third-party web browsers such as Firefox or Chrome, and so you're stuck with IE uh, through policy enforcement. So that could be a possibility as well. So a lot more of your governmental and perhaps defense contractors, and even corporate America type networks, are probably a little more restricted and and do restrict what browsers people can use, and they might be limited to IE in some cases. Some people just don't like to use IE, and they probably shut their head and say, but that's a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and some people, yeah. like developers, have to use IE. So they have to, I mean, to well, test software. And absolutely. Like They've got to test the, the so sites they're creating, make sure they're comfortable. Yes. Yes. Right, Mike? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, 
And some some users have to use IE because sites they use support only support IE and things. There like are sites that like still use ActiveX, which so is really amazing to me. Yeah, there are there. <laughs> you 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 run. Or you're stuck with shit or something. You get into that sometime for it's like you have to use IE. You know, yeah. Like, really? Yeah, that, that's so. particularly true of SharePoint server sites. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, that's a whole and other rant. I don't think we're here to talk about that specifically. But, uh, yeah. So, so this is a particular problem, uh, mostly because it exploits some possibly several zero day exploits, and it doesn't hang around long enough for you to find out. What it is, so. yes. and other exploits on the on the, uh, on the site that they compromise as well. That who knows who they are or what they are or anything like that. So it's very sophisticated, from or exceptionally accomplished, as it was put in the yeah. article. Um, and the the payload of this particular malicious well the malicious payload payload of this particular exploit it says. Uh, Uses three levels of XOR decoding uh, before it takes over the infected machine. So there's a lot of complexity here to, to kind of prevent detection of it. So it's nasty stuff. So so a patch won't be coming next week. Probably not. Uh, so it seems like it'd be hard. Seems, seems like it'd be hard to track this one down. Probably. Of course, I guess if they've identified the site, they can have their little machines. Even in running, running traces on it, so right. All right, anything else? All right, well, thanks to Mike Hill and Pete Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.